Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Pollinator Week virtual program series. Uh, I am Katie Hobgood from Save the Dunes, and it is day one of Pollinator Week. Each evening this week at 6 p.m., we'll be bringing you virtual presentations all about pollinators. And to kick things off today, we have something very special in store for you. Um, our very own Victoria Wittig will be unveiling our brand new pollinator garden landscaping guide. It is beautiful, it is informative, and you are going to love it. Um, but before I turn things over to Victoria, I'd like to quickly highlight what we have planned for the rest of the week. So if you go to savedunes.org and click on news, you will see this event. And if you aren't on Facebook, this is a good way to get to our events throughout the week. Um, so as I mentioned today, we are doing the unveiling of our wonderful guide. And then the rest of the week, some of our um, expert advisory committee members will be bringing the guide to life. Uh, so talking about how to incorporate um, pollinator habitat into your own garden, um, learning about some of the work that's happening to better understand some of the pollinators in our region. We're gonna talk about art and culture and how that relates to pollinators. And then Friday, we'll wrap things up with a look at some broader work that's happening in pollinator conservation and how you can be a part of helping that work progress as well. So one thing I'd like to point out here at the bottom, you can sign up to receive a digital copy of our pollinator guide that we are going to be talking about today as soon as it is released. This will make sure that you receive uh, your guide as soon as possible. <laughs> I would definitely be remiss if I did not give a huge thank you um, to NIPSCO and NYSource Charitable Foundation for sponsoring our Pollinator Week virtual program series. Uh, they are a wonderful partner and be sure to turn in on Friday when uh, they will be one of our presenters for, for that presentation. And I'd also like to, of course, thank our generous funders who made the Living in the Dunes um, Pollinator Habitat Landscaping Guide possible. So this was um, made possible through a grant from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Lake Michigan Coastal Program. And matching support was generously provided by BP, the McDougal Family Foundation, NIPSCO, and the Unity Foundation and printing and outreach support was provided in part by a grant from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So we've had tremendous support of this guide um, and we are so excited to share it with you today. So I know uh, why you're all here, so I will stop talking <laughs> and without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you my incredibly talented colleague, Victoria Wittig. Uh, Victoria has more than 15 years of experience in the environmental field, including roles within academic, science policy, government, international development, and nonprofit sectors. Victoria holds a Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences, um, emphasis ecology, from the University of Illinois. And she earned her PhD from the Department of Plant Biology, also from the University of Illinois. Her research examined the impacts of rising concentrations of carbon dioxide and ground level ozone pollution on the growth and productivity of trees and is published in the peer reviewed literature, including Wittig et al. 2005, 2007, and 2009. Victoria has a passion for biodiversity um, preservation and through her work endeavors to connect people to the incredible diversity of life all around them. Victoria grew up in the dunes and is often found searching for crinoid fossils on the beach, identifying native butterflies, figuring out how to put more native plants in her garden, or relaxing at home with Cosmo, her wonderfully intelligent cat. So, Victoria, take it away. Thank you so much, Katie. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank Katie Hobgood for all of the incredible support that she has provided throughout the course of this project and for her incredible facilitation skills and editing skills, which as you tune into our programs later in the week, you will fully appreciate. Uh, before um, we unveil 
this pollinator garden landscaping guide, I want to take the opportunity to um, highlight some of the incredible experts that are behind the scenes making it happen. Um, so uh, the full um, slate of our committee and project team are, are not available um, for our presentation this evening, but some of them are. And so at this time, I'm going to call on some of them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their connection to the project. Um, so I'm to simplify things, I'm, I'm just going to call on you in the order that I see you in the screen. So go ahead and unmute yourself and take it away. And we will start with um, the infamous and incredible Eric Bird. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Eric Bird. I'm the stewardship director for Shirley Hines Land Trust. Um, so we preserve, manage, and restore natural areas in Northwest Indiana uh, with a, a big focus on biodiversity and a lot of our work um, focuses on pollinator habitat and connectivity for pollinators and other wildlife. Um, we'll also, uh, I'll be with you tomorrow talking a little bit about our Bringing Nature Home recognition program, which is uh, to recognize folks that are putting native plants in their own home garden for pollinators. So thank you, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Eric. We're happy to have you. Um, next, Joel Perez. Hello, everyone. My name is Joel Perez. I am the project director for um, here, here in Northwest Indiana for the Nature Conservancy. Um, most of uh, the sites for my office are dune and soil sites. Um, so it's a pleasure for me to work on a guide um, like this. Uh, I, you will hear from me later in the week um, talking about the East Chicago Monarch Festival um, that some of our partners, including some that are here, um, helped me with uh, to, to really celebrate um, people and their connections to the monarch butterfly and other pollinators. So I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Joel. And Joel Balden. Hi hey everybody, my name is Joel Balden. I'm a principal with Hitchcock Design Group. We are the uh, lead consultant and landscape architect for the guide. Um, I'm also here with my colleague, Kate Buellen, who will introduce herself shortly. She's waving, I should wave. Um, it was an honor working on this. Um, I, I wish I personally could take a lot of credit, but I'm not. I help facilitate a lot of things, but uh, everyone on these screens are experts and did a great job. And just, it was, it was a pleasure working on this. You'll also notice that uh, um, this is volume two. Um, volume one was Living in the Dunes, a homeowner's guide to landscaping in the Dunes community. And if you haven't seen that, please uh, go to Save the Dunes website or look around. I don't know if there's copies anywhere anymore in, in the area, but that was uh, an outstanding guide as well as an award-winning guide. We won a lot of awards for that particular project and I anticipate we will again for this one. Um, and hopefully down the road, volume three and volume four will come around. So thanks again. And uh, um, that's it. Thank you, Joel. And thank you for uh, lending us Kate Bulin, who has been my partner in crime on a lot of the behind the scenes work on the guide. So Kate, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Kate Bulin. Um, I'm a junior associate for Hitchcock Design Group. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to help out with the original guide, but I have been honored to help a lot with the current guide, um, doing a lot with graphics and editing and a lot of the side with uh, Victoria going over species and input and everything. So it's been a lot of fun uh, and I'm super excited for this to roll out. Couldn't have done it without you, Kate. Well, next we have Desi Robertson. Hi, I'm Desi Robertson. I'm the research coordinator for the Great Lakes Research and Education Center, which is a program um, hosted by the Indiana Dunes National Park. And uh, I am an entomologist and I'm involved in a number of research projects involving pollinators. And I'm also um, involved with the partnership that we'll be speaking about on Friday um, with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to restore pollinator habitat in the region. Um, and then also on Wednesday, I'll be talking about some of that um, native bee research and other pollinator research going on at Indiana Dunes National Park and some of our other parks in the Great Lakes. Um, I'm really, really excited about this guide. It's just been so much fun working on it and it's, it's beautiful. I can't wait for everyone to see it. Thank you, Desi. 
Thank you for all of your B expertise. Yes. Um, next, we have Carl Ackerman. And hopefully his- Hi, thanks everybody. My name's Carl Ackerman. And I think he has a-, a How's my connection? It's, it's got a little so bit of- So I'll do that. Yeah. We've got the use of uh, native plants in the home landscape. And so we're a group of gardeners. I'm on the National Board of Directors. We have over 5,000 members. And I'm also, uh, of course, actively involved in our local chapter that uh, meets out of uh, Gibson Woods in uh, Hammond. So I'm honored to be here, thanks. Thank you, Carl. And I'm so excited for tomorrow's presentation featuring a tour that Carl took me on through his incredible native garden, which is almost like a botanic garden for native plants. The amount of pollinators that it supports, the amount of wildlife that it supports is astonishing. So please tune in tomorrow for a tour of, of that phenomenal um, garden. Um, next, we have Susan Kurt. And Susan, I think you might be on your phone. And if you, if nope. you there we go. A little bit better. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm not sideways. Hi, I'm Susan Kurt, and I am a biology professor at Chicago State University. And I am on board as one of the photographers for this project. And I'll be giving a presentation slash video uh, on Thursday. Yes, indeed. Um, I was overjoyed to have an opportunity to take a video of Susan taking her incredible photographs and she'll be featured taking photographs with her iPhone and two specialist cameras. Um, so a lot of the pictures that you're going to see in the guide are original Susan Kurt images. Um, and so I imagine people are going to want to know how she makes that magic happen. So tune in on Thursday to learn more. Thank you, Susan. And next we have Laura Milkert. Hi everyone, I'm Laura Milkert. I'm with the Field Museum and our Keller Science Action Center. I'm our conservation ecology manager and it's been a real pleasure to be a part of this uh, project. And I can't wait to see this resource go out into the world. Um, we have a whole monarch and pollinator conservation initiative uh, focused oftentimes in the Calumet region. And um, we're really working towards a Calumet National Heritage Area. And I can't think of a, you know, more nationally significant story than some of the rich biodiversity that we have in the climate region. And this guy, I think, is a, is a piece of telling that story. So um, again, it's been a pleasure to be a part of this project and um, looking forward to more pollinator efforts. Thank you, Laura. And next we have Nathaniel Pella. Yeah, I'm, uh, I came on uh, with the Hitchcock Design Group team as an environmental consultant. I am a uh, botanist amongst other things, but in title, especially. And did an incredible job um, bringing the pollinators and plants to life for us with extensive research and information. We really couldn't have um, put this guide together without Nathaniel's expertise. And not to mention, he was on the original team for the original Living in the Dunes guide. So we were thrilled to bring him on board for volume two. And so I think that wraps our introductions of those on the on the Zoom and Facebook Live today. So I want to make sure that I'm pulling up the right screen, and and we're off. So thank you again for tuning in for something that has been in the works for three years, believe it or not, Living in the Dunes, a homeowner's guide to pollinator garden landscaping in Indiana's coastal communities. This is volume two of a series that we're hoping results in many more volumes to come, but are overjoyed to not only showcase the incredible photography, which you're seeing here on the cover is a Susan Kurt original of a red spotted butterfly and a cone flower, um, and, and so much more within this guide. Um, if you would like more information, feel free to reach out for, 
reach out to me, Victoria at savedunes.org. Um, both myself and Katie are putting together outreach programs for the remainder of this year and beyond to bring the guide to life for you and your garden club, your community. Um, we really want the guide to be something user-friendly and celebrated as much as possible across, across the region. Um, so several folks that were um, not able to join us today are highlighted here on our acknowledgements page. And so just to give you um, an overview before I, I get too much further into it, I'm just going to go page by page through this incredibly gorgeous guide uh, to help illustrate some of the, the features, the information, um, and, and hopefully captivate you with the incredible possibilities that a native garden holds for our pollinators. Um, so I wanted to mention Laura Henderson, who's a, a naturalist and monitor of butterflies in the region, also a member of the Indiana Native Plant Society. And Laura is the person I can credit with taking me out to see my first Baltimore checker spot. And um, we followed that checker spot and found its host plant, the turtle head, and, and we're even more thrilled to find um, a, a whole batch of eggs that had recent, recently been laid. Um, also, I wanted to highlight Brianne Lowe from the um, USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service, who's also part of the committee and has provided a lot of input and content, um, particularly around the rusty patched bumblebee and the European honeybee. Um, Steve Sass, who's with Indiana Nature. Um, some of you that are on Facebook might be familiar with the Indiana Nature Group. It's incredibly popular, wonderful community of uh, native plant and pollinator enthusiasts. And we were thrilled to have Steve a part of this committee and lend his um, expertise. Um, he specifically highlighted some common misconceptions that are um, you know, had about pollinators and you know, trying to demystify um, what those misconceptions are. Um, also, Ron Trigg, um, the former director of Shirley Hines Land Trust, um, a frequent contributor to their newsletters, but he's also an incredible naturalist and photographer, and I'm thrilled that his photographs are featured throughout this guide. So along with Susan Kurt, Ron Trigg has really helped to bring the guide to life with their photographs. And there were other uh, photographic contributions um, from Jeffrey Belf, who's the author of Butterflies of Indiana, and also from one of Laura Milkert's colleagues, John Balaban. Um, and uh, we're just so thankful for their contributions. Um, and with regard to our project team, um, Gina Altieri and Betsy Serdar, um, from Phoenix 7 Marketing are the brains behind the graphic design and the incredibly beautiful layout of the guide. Um, Betsy, Kate, and I have been hard at work day after day on this for weeks and weeks on end. Um, and I'm just so overjoyed and impressed by the skills that this team has brought to the project. Um, Barb Spies Labus um, was also a member of our project team and shortly you're going to see her original illustrations that bring native pollinator gardens to life through the seasons. And again, I wanted to highlight that this whole project was made possible by a whole assort assortment of funders. Um, the project kicked off with support from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Lake Michigan Coastal Program. Um, with that funding support, we were able to attract matching funds from BP, the McDougall Family Foundation, NYSOR SNPSCO, and the Unity Foundation. We're so grateful for that um, essential matching support. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is providing even a, more support to help us get the word out and get some printed copies in your hands so that pollinator gardens are going to thrive across our landscape. So with all of that said, um, I think I want to bring your attention to um, an author who has inspired me and a lot of native gardeners that I know, a lot of conservationists that I know, um, and really kind of captures the spirit of the guide. And so I'll read this off for you. Um, and this is from Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, <laughs> pardon me, and the Teaching of Plants. 
So knowing that you love the earth changes you. Pardon me, I get emotional. This is meaningful for me. <laughs> it activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. Nothing captures the joys of a native pollinator garden more than that, because the work that you put into putting those plants in your landscape rewards you with visits by some of the most extraordinary and beautiful creatures that need those plants to survive. So this guide is endeavoring to empower you with the tools and inspiration to transform your home gardens with the native plants that support an astonishing diversity of native pollinators. And so the guide features content on six ecosystems, seven groups of pollinators, dozens of native plants, and builds on this information by offering six ecosystem themed template garden designs suitable for your landscape. The gorgeous illustrations that Barb has created showcase the seasonal changes in a pollinator garden and provides that visual of what the possibilities are for you, the possibilities that await. Uh, the photographs bring the majesty of the species to life and also highlights their close associations. And the content that the committee has created um, provides you with not only information, but the tools that you need to maintain, sustain, and enjoy the bounties of your native pollinator garden for years and years to come. And so as you move from the inside front cover and that introduction, the next um, piece that you'll see is this incredible map of the Indiana coastal region. And what's gonna draw your attention first is the mosaic of colors. Each of these colors represents one of six ecosystem types found here in the Indiana coastal region. In fact, this region is one of the most biodiverse in the entire country because of all of the ecosystems that it supports. Um, here we're situated at the western edge of the prairie, the eastern edge of the deciduous forests, and at the southern edge of boreal species, in addition to having sandy shoreline ecosystems that can provide uh, suitable habitat for desert species. So an ecosystem is defined as the plants and wildlife that exist together in an area that has similar non-living conditions. That means amount of precipitation, the temperature regime, the types of soils, the solar exposure. And so what we wanted to showcase for the region's residents is that there are these different ecosystem types that are each suitable for different types of plant assemblages that are suitable for an assortment of pollinators. So we really have an unparalleled opportunity in this region to bring back the pre-settlement landscape in our home gardens. Just imagine if we transformed a little patch of grass in each and every home garden across this landscape with plants suitable for these ecosystems, we sure would have an opportunity to support our pollinators. So moving from the ecosystem spread, next we showcase seven groups of native pollinators. And our intention here was to provide the most stunning images we could find to make it irresistible for you to put a native plant in your garden and invite these native pollinators to visit those plants. Um, here, what we're starting out with are five groups of native bees, native bees that might be a foreign topic to a lot of people because most of us are only familiar with the honeybee. It's actually not a native bee, it's a European bee species, and it's used to help pollinate agricultural crops. Um, these agricultural crops being pollinated by honeybees have led to honeybees being naturalized in our natural areas where they can potentially outcompete our native bees. And our native bees are much more efficient at pollinating our native plants than a non-native bee would be. They've evolved through the ages to visit and forage for pollen and pollinate as they're collecting all of our native flowers. 
and they're so incredibly cute. Um, working on this guide, one of the greatest joys for me was learning about the bees. So for example, um, the bumblebees, these are the big bumblers that sort of hover through your garden on tiny little wings that it's extraordinary to realize can support their big furry bodies. And they bumble around and they pollinate and they, they actually can do a buzz pollination. They're the only native bee group that forms colonies. So you think of the honeybee and the honeybee hive, our bumblebees are the colony forming species. These other bees are solitary, the mining bees, the sweat bees, the leaf cutter bees, the mason bees, and they each have these fascinating ecological niches. They nest in the ground, they nest in the cavities of hollow plants or, or, or logs, um, and they carry the their pollen in, on different parts of their body. So for me, it was such a revelation to realize that not all bees pack the pollen on their hind legs. And actually it's a, a combination of nectar and pollen that this bumblebee is then going to use in, the, in its nest to feed its babies. Well, the leaf cutter bees, which have these mouth parts that actually cut leaves, they physically cut leaves and line their nest they collect the pollen on their abdomen. And then of course we have the mason bees, the absolutely adorable little guys that look like they rolled out of bed and didn't brush their hair and went out into the world anyway. Uh, these guys are incredibly cute. Um, so um, charismatic once you understand what you're looking at. And they're actually in a lot of trouble right now. They need native plants and nesting habits in our landscapes to survive. So if that wasn't enough, what about the butterflies? Of course, the monarch butterfly is one of the most recognizable and celebrated butterflies in the region across the country and beyond. They're gorgeous. They have this incredible long distance migration up to 3000 miles spanning three countries. And they have cultural connections to people in all of the places that they migrate through. But the monarch butterfly, sometimes I think of it as the gateway bug. People are now um, hyper aware that our monarch populations are plummeting. In fact, they've declined by more than 80% in just two decades. That's 20 years, 80% reduction in populations. And so folks at the Field Museum and the Nature Conservancy and all the groups uh, you know, that participated in this guide are trying to um, help folks understand that Monarchs need milkweeds, members of the Asclepius genus. And there's a variety of, of Asclepius milkweeds out there. And they used to be widespread across North America. But habitat conversion for agriculture and development has essentially eliminated milkweed from such large swaths of the landscape that the monarch butterflies, caterpillars, don't have any food to eat. Now, with the understanding that a host plant is required for a butterfly's life cycle to be completed, we have this opportunity, right? It's sort of like the gateway bug. We have an opportunity to understand that our other native butterflies, for example, this incredibly gorgeous Baltimore checker spot needs a turtle head plant for its caterpillars to have the nutrition that it needs to survive through to the adult stage. Um, there are uh, so many butterflies and oh my goodness, one of the hardest jobs for me was to select the butterflies that we would feature in this guide. Only six. How can you only feature six? So I squeezed in a viceroy down here, <laughs> which is um, has co-evolved to mimic the coloration and patterns of the monarch, which if you didn't know, the reason why the caterpillars need that milkweed is because it offers the protection from predation by birds. The milkweeds have a chemical inside that are, is really disgusting. It's really untasty and, and horrible for birds. So if a bird eats one monarch caterpillar or one monarch adult butterfly, that's it, never again. And so that's a, a form of protection, right? And so the viceroy, although it doesn't eat the milkweeds, when we protect the monarch, its populations have, have some more potential to thrive in our landscapes too. Um, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail is another. Um, it has host plants um, in our 
in our forests. So tulip trees and black cherries, native trees, that's where the tiger swallowtail will lay its eggs. The spice bush swallowtail, you guessed it, spice bush is its host plant, but it's also able to lay its eggs on sassafras. So that eastern tiger swallowtail, the spice bush swallowtail highlights something different. Um, it's more of a generalist strategy where the caterpillars can eat a, a number of different plants, whereas for the monarch butterfly, they need milkweeds, right? A great spangled fritillary, as with all the fritillaries, of which there are numerous and beautiful varieties, need violets, those lovely, charming little flowers that pop up in your garden in the springtime, and more. And it goes on and on. And so here, you know, we're showcasing two of the seven groups of pollinators. And when, within each of these flags, we have some information that will help you um, to understand what it is they need, what it is they're doing, and what kind of plants um, will support their life cycles. Moving along, um, once you have an affinity for butterflies, you are nearly ready to jump off the ledge and fall in love with the moths. My goodness, the native moths that we have in the region are not only stunning, they're pollinators and they too need our native plants. And so a Virginia Chattanooga, when the committee recommended that we feature this guy in the guide, I thought, well, look, it has these, you know, dull black wings. And they're like, no, when you see it, the head is this metallic blue, its body is this metallic, it's stunning. Well, I guarantee you, they were right. Um, Susan Kurt and I were out in Crestmore Prairie, one of Shirley Hine Land Trust's uh, nature preserves just last week, and there were so many Virginia Chattanookas, and they are gorgeous. When they spread their wings, you see that metallic blue. Um, but we have others, the Pandora Sphinx. Um, you know, it has a host plant in the Virginia Creeper. What a beautiful moth. I mean, the coloration, the patterns are, are breathtaking. Or what about the chickweed geometer with the feather antennae, this lovely pink blush line and border. And then of course, what some gardeners refer to as the hummingbird moths. Who knew that moths would develop a, a flight pattern and nectaring um, habit that resembles the hummingbird. So sometimes, you know, gardeners will say, oh my gosh, I had this incredible insect. It looked like a miniature hummingbird. It was a moth. Um, these are daytime species and they're, they're going to be found in your native garden nectaring on your pollinator plants. And then of course, we have the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now this is the only uh, pollinating bird in the region um, and it's prized. So Featuring plants like cardinal flower or red columbine guarantees that you're going to have hummingbirds visit your garden. So those of you that are active with your hummingbird feeders and whatnot, you know, you could put in a couple of native plants and not have to change that feeder and you're going to have hummingbirds and, and that nutrition from those native plants is what their uh, metabolism is actually designed for. So they will, they will appreciate you for it. And so I hope I'm drawing you into the love of pollinators that I have and that our committee and project team have. But it, you know, it does get better. The more you learn, the more incredible it becomes. Beetles are actually incredibly eff effective pollinators. Now they're not out to actually pollinate a plant. They're on these flowers foraging for pollen for food. And so if you put goldenrod in your garden, you're guaranteed, guaranteed to have a goldenrod soldier beetle. You put Asclepias species or milkweeds in your garden, you're going to have the large milkweed bug. You're also potentially going to find this extraordinary beetle. Yes, that's a beetle and not a bee. The hairy flower beetle. It's a bee mimic. Who knew that a beetle could be so cute? <laughs> Um, and not to mention the cuteness of flies. Did I ever think I was going to say a fly was cute? Probably not 10 years ago, but today, yes, the great bee fly is adorable. Look how furry its little body is. Or look at the hoverfly with the patterns and coloration of the bees. My goodness, it's just an extraordinarily gorgeous species when you see it up close. 
and then dun 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 oh no the wasps those problematic stingers oh dear well guess what wasps are not aggressive species unless they're harassed in many cases as is the case for the great golden digger wasp which if you look at close up has hairs that truly resemble threads of gold they're beautiful and to make it even better, once you begin to appreciate how you can avoid, you know, um, aggravating species in the garden, well, this wasp will actually prey on problematic pests that are attacking your vegetables. So it, it actually preys on garden pests. So it's a, it's a helpful um, species to have in the garden. Now here we also have on this spread um, a treatment of metamorphosis, which is one of the most magnificent transformations in nature. It's performed by members of the Lepidopter family or the butterflies and the moths. And this transformation is often only possible with a specific host plant like this milk, uh, monarch caterpillar uh, feasting on a milkweed leaf. All right, and so here you can um, start to understand this, this transformative process that is linked directly to host plants for caterpillar food and the nectar plants for the adults to get the nutrition they need to fly around, find a mate, and start the cycle anew. Uh, we've also got some wonderful content to help illuminate where pollinators live. Sometimes that's a bit of a mystery. Um, so with this guide, you'll start to learn more and appreciate where in your garden you can um, find pollinator habitat. And then we have this. Now, I'm not sure how many are watching right now that are familiar with the ecosystems of the Indiana Coastal Region poster series that Barb Spies Labus has been working on for many years with the support of the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. I could not believe my luck when Barb agreed to join our project team to create four original illustrations that showcase the majesty of the changes that a garden goes through during the seasons. Not just the changes in the plants, but what's happening with the pollinators in each season. What are they doing? Are they nectaring? Are they caterpillars and feeding? Are they nesting? And then of course, featuring you, uh, you know, bringing the garden, you know, back home for you so that you understand that you are also a member of this garden, which is actually habitat that you're creating to nurture these pollinators. Um, year after year. And so here in spring, we see the bounty of spring ephemerals and caterpillars emerging to eat the violet leaf. This is a fritillary caterpillar. Of course, here's our, one of our um, large bumblers heading for um, our Virginia bluebell, our service berry, red bud, a tulip tree, a cherry tree, the Dutchman's breeches, red columbine. We have anemones and lupins. Oh, I'm so in love with these illustrations. I can't even begin to tell you. I'm trying to tell you now, I guess. But anyhow, um, here we have summertime, which is uh, when pollinators are in full swing. And uh, Barb has showcased how a milkweed plant supports the full life cycle of the monarch, where you see the adult butterfly ovipositing or laying an egg on the underside of a leaf. Eventually, the caterpillar emerges from that egg and starts to crunch and munch on those milkweed leaves. Then it will transform into a chrysalis and the cycle completes. Uh, we have uh, some native bees uh, foraging on St. John's wort and Coreopsis. Um, we have a fritillary nectaring on Liatris. Lots of cone flowers in full bloom. There's Joe Pie weed here in the background with which is a bonanza for pollinators and will also bring out your goldfinches. Of course, here we have the incredible um, tiger swallowtail, one of the largest butterflies in the region, a joy to behold. Um, again, laying its eggs on um, trees like the tulip tree or the black cherry, but is a frequent visitor to pollinator gardens. Spiderwort and penstemum. Um, some of you will know your penstemum is just about done blooming right now. Um, we've got geraniums back here and baptisia, indigos, 
uh, then we move into fall. And, and here, I hope you're starting to um, understand that a pollinator garden is full of life in every season. And if you have the information you need, you can actually provide plants from early spring through late fall to support pollinators for the entirety of their life cycle. And so in the fall, sometimes people are like, what do I plant in the fall? And the go-tos are golden rods and asters. Absolutely, those are a winner. Here we have the golden rods and we have the asters, which will be exploding at about the same time the monarda is going out of bloom. And these guys are really wonderful when the monarchs are migrating across the lake, heading down to their overwintering sites, and they need that boost of pollen to, to support their journey. So here we have you know, that essential role of our goldenrods and our asters. But did you also know that virgin spower clematis? It's a native clematis. So you know, any gardener knows that clematis is a gorgeous vine with many different colors and patterns and it, it's just gorgeous. But we have a native clematis and it blooms in the fall and it is a magnet for pollinators. Um, I also wanted to highlight, of course, um, the fringed gentian, which if you look closely at your tubular flowers like the gentian or the physostigia or the penstemon, um, you're going to see a bee butt. And that's because these you know, bumblebees are going to dive headfirst into those flowers searching for their, their pollen and nectar and then you get a little bee butt there. So I, I think they're absolutely adorable. Um, and of course, you know, we have our, um, our ruby throated hummingbird nectaring on cardinal flower. And here we have a spice bush swallowtail, which is another large butterfly that is magnificent to behold in your garden. Well, pollinator gardens are not done in the winter time, um, leaving your flowers with their standing, you know, stems and, and seed heads actually provides natural bird feeders for our native birds that don't migrate out of the region like our goldfinches. Um, there's also bees that live in the cavities of these plant stems. You know, leaving the leaves in your garden allows the, the caterpillars for our beautiful fritillaries to survive the winter where you know, they overwinter in the leaves as caterpillars, uh, providing access to the soil so not over mulching your soil, um, allows our bumblebee queens to um, have an overwintering cavity. The minor bees also, they form um, cavities in the ground for their pupa, which that's how they overwinter. Um, and here we have is a very well camouflaged. This is a swallowtail chrysalis. Um, and the swallowtails all have slightly different variations in how their chrysalis looks, but you know, they blend in. And when you leave those structures in the garden, or sometimes you'll find them on your house, on the, on the siding of your house, those um, beautiful, magnificent butterflies overwinter as a chrysalis. Um, and so as you're building your snowman and enjoying the gorgeous sparkling snow, realize and understand that your native garden is still alive underground and, um, and through the seasons. So I'm, and I'm thrilled to have the ability to showcase this guide, but my goodness, what an honor it has been to have Barb on board with our team to create these incredible illustrations. And so here we have Hitch, Hitchcock Design Group really showing their stuff. What we've done here is create six template garden designs that have plant lists suitable for our different ecosystem types. All right, so our six ecosystems. Now, these different ecosystem types and the conditions within in them may be found in different places around your home landscape. So maybe you have a really hot, dry, sunny area. Well, that's perfect for a prairie planting, a full sun prairie planting. And so here we have some options for you to consider of some plants to include in that planting. And if those don't work for you, we've provided you with a backup list of alternatives. And that goes for each and every ecosystem type. And boy, did Hitchcock hit this one out of the park. I'm so thrilled with how this has turned out. Not only is it beautiful, it's so informative and it connects back to the fact 
that the Indiana coastal region is incredibly diverse. And when we think about what we're putting in the landscape, we're actually creating connectivity from to our natural areas like the, the National Park or the State Park or Shirley Hines Land Trust, incredible nature preserves. And we're all working so hard uh, to protect. Well, you can protect them too by creating you know, an assemblage of plants in your own landscape. Whew. And so I could I could almost be done, but I'm not. <laughs> so here we have um, our list of native plants for you to consider. And this list was cultivated by our committee. Um, we had a couple of priorities. One, we wanted to make sure that there were options for native plants that support pollinators throughout the growing season. So from early spring to late fall. And so our plant list is organized by bloom time with these handy um, graphics that Hitchcock designed for us. Kate did an amazing job with that. I'm so glad, I'm so happy with how that turned out. And so we you know, feature these incredibly beautiful images of the native plants, provide you with the connection to the ecosystem, pollinator host plant connections, what pollinators really enjoy them and some tips. Um, and so, you know, Dutchman's breeches, Virginia bluebells, bloodroot, trilliums, violets in the spring, columbine, um, geraniums, lupins, moving into the summer, the coreopsis, the indigos, the anemones, my gosh. And as you're, you know, looking at this, you're probably like, oh, look, I've got more information here. So what is pollination? What is it that we're actually talking about? We're talking about a plant being able to complete its life cycle. So right now we're really trying to drive home the point of you know, how you can support pollinators. But guess what? When you support the pollinators, you're also supporting the native plants that need them to complete their life cycle. So our natural areas in the Indiana coastal region or anywhere else on earth would not be diverse without the native pollination that's going on by these hardworking and incredibly charismatic species that we hope you want to bring into your garden. Here we've got a feature on common misconceptions about pollinators, including some information about wasps and why not to be afraid. Um, here's more of our plants as you move through bloom time. Um, hopefully you're starting to realize that we've also done some very hard work finding images of each and every plant that showcases how pollinators are interacting with them. So a lot of times they're nectaring or foraging for pollen. Uh, you know, you might have a, a longhorn bee that just came out of its nap in the late afternoon. They actually take naps in these Physostigia obedient plants. It's awfully cute to know that bees take naps. Um, we also, um, you know, have our black eyed Susans, our Joe pie weeds, cardinal flowers, bee balms, heliopsis, uh, golden rods, um, but also wanted to highlight um, a couple of other issues. So, you know, habitat loss is driving uh, widespread reductions in pollinator populations, but so is climate change and so are pesticides. And so the Carner blue butterfly um, is an iconic species for our region because lupins are an iconic flower in our region. And due to some changes in rainfall, uh, spring temperatures, we no longer have Carner blues in the Indiana coastal region. It's known as being locally extirpated. So it's not extinct. It's still around in, uh, in neighboring states, but we don't have it here anymore because the its requirements for lupin combined with the impacts from climate change have pushed it out. Well, that is a possibility for one of our bumblebees, the rusty patch bumblebee. So what we're hoping that you do is realize that this, you know, the, the perils facing pollinators are real and happening. And the tools that you have in this guide hopefully inspire you, make it irresistible, but even just one native plant can make a difference in a landscape, in a pot, on a balcony. Native plants have the potential to help these pollinators overcome the impacts of climate change, building uh, resilience to the biodiversity in our region. 
Um, one other really fascinating subject that came up during uh, the production of this guide was the fact that fireflies are actually associated with milkweed plants, just like the monarch butterfly, just like the large milkweed beetle. Um, fireflies, as it turns out, or what science is discovering, this is very new science, but in all of the observations being made about milkweed, scientists have started to realize that fireflies, which are actually a beetle, poorly named fly, fire beetle, um, but they fly. Um, anyhow, they are actually um, drawing out the chemicals from milkweed to derive the same types of predator protections that monarchs are. So our fireflies also rely on native plants to an extent. And they're so sensitive to pesticides that you can almost see like a, uh, an invisible wall in your yard compared to a potentially neighboring property where pesticides are used heavily. You'll see fireflies light up in your yard and not in theirs because pesticides are so deadly to these sensitive creatures. And who wouldn't want to keep fireflies around? I certainly am captivated um, even today it fills me with wonder every time I see them flashing. And so the guide starts to wrap up with um, some of the later blooming species and their pollinator connections. There's that gentian with the uh, bumblebee butt that Barb <laughs> recreated in our fall illustration. Um, we've also provided a selection of native trees, shrubs, and that uh, native clematis. Um, these are very important host plants, early nectar sources, um, uh, beacons for pollinators, uh, and all native, and wonderful to feature in your landscape. Uh, we provide some tips to maintain your garden, how to get started, what are the essential features, for example, food, water, shelter, a place to, to rear young, and then finally, uh, a whole suite of resources to, to make sure that you can find the plants that you need to get your garden going. So we've listed some of our native plant sales in the region, the Friends of the Indiana Dunes, the Wild Ones, Gibson Woods Chapter, the Indiana Wildlife Federation, Open Lands. Um, we've also listed some garden centers and nurseries that stock native plants. Um, and then additional resources in case you're so enthralled by this that you can't wait to learn more. Um, we have Native Garden Certification and Award opportunities so you can recognize um, all of your hard work, get a sign and have that posted in your garden and help spread the word with your neighbors. Um, we've got a cultivated list of resources that we would recommend you read for more information. For example, the infamous Doug Tallamy. Um, and his books are really driving a lot of the effort nationwide and the awareness about native garden, the potential of native gardens. And then, of course, um, Save the Dunes. You know, our Living in the Dunes guides, um, uh, we hope this one will be as much of a hit as the original one, because if it is, wow, do we have the potential to turn the tide for our pollinators. And so again, I wanted to thank um, everybody who helped make this possible, including all the staff at Save the Dunes, our advisory committee, our project team, our generous funders, and of course, all of you. So with that, Katie, I think I'm running short on time, uh, but wanted to turn it back over in case we had any questions crop up in our Facebook chat. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, what did I tell you? That was amazing. <laughs> I'm absolutely in love with this guide. Um, we don't have any questions currently on our, our Facebook live event. For anybody who's watching, either on the, the live event or after, um, please feel free to, to comment a question. And I'm likely not going to get to it right now, but we will definitely follow up with you um, to, to make sure that we, we fulfill all of your pollinator needs. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Katie. And so if we don't have any questions, now is a really great time to, to bring back up our, our schedule of pollinator programs for the rest of the week. We've got more in store. We're actually bringing the guide to life with uh, videos 
um, tours and presentations by some of our incredible um, project team and, and committee members. So. Okay, let's see. Shall I sh share my screen? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Katie. No problem. Okay, here it is again. So you can check this one off the list. You've accomplished Monday, but watch it again because it was that great. Um, tomorrow, we are going to be diving into developing pollinator habitat in your home garden. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to hear from some of our pollinator experts about the work that they are doing to better understand our pollinators in the region. On Thursday, we're talking about pollinator art, photography, and culture. It's going to be a really fantastic presentation. And then Friday, we'll wrap things up by taking that landscape scale look at some of the pollinator conservation work that's happening in the region. Um, and we'll give you some some tips on how you can can help our work by uh, including pollinator gardens in your own yards. And don't forget, if you haven't already, be sure to sign up to receive your copy of the guide when it come, becomes available. You can go on our website to this page here to sign up, but I've also posted it in the comments of the Facebook Live event. Wonderful. Thank you, Katie. Was I, I hope I wasn't talking too fast. But if I was, don't worry, you can get an electronic copy of the guide or your own printed version at a Save the Dunes event or program coming up. So we hope that you can't wait to get your hands on one and, and really get those native gardens going. So. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we hope we will see you for the rest of our Pollinator Week presentations. And thank you for our, um, our advisory committee members for, for joining us and, and coming along on this wonderful journey of our, our already beloved guide. So thank you. Thank you guys. Enjoy your evening and we'll see you next time. See you soon.